I've never done anything like this before really, um, but I'm just about to go on to a podcast, the Sean Atwood podcast, and talk about my Russell Brand documentary. So that's quite exciting. I am quite nervous though, so I don't really know what I'm going to do with this video. I'm just, I'm literally practicing to talk right now, just in case, you know, come off a bit weird, could happen. Yeah, I mean, well, it's probably not even that big a deal. I've got a YouTube channel with uh, 15 subscribers at the moment, so it would be really rude if they were to call me out and say, you know, why did we bother getting you on? I didn't ask, they actually invited me on. So um, I'm hoping, yeah, that this just goes fine. I just now need to answer questions about my own documentary. So when I think about it that way, uh, it should be no problem really. Because if they're going to ask me about what I do, then surely I can explain that. I'm just going to bring in our next guest. Uh, Josh, thanks for speaking. So sorry to keep you waiting there. How are you, sir? I'm good, thanks. How about yourself? Not too bad. Thank you very much. Um, well, we've got you on today to speak about Russell Brand and, and the Dispatches documentary that kind of blew up the TV for one night. It was all weird. We all sat and watched TV at the same yeah. time which nobody ever does anymore uh it took over the internet for a significant portion it feels like people have moved on already has he had his um his uh 60 seconds of uh rage now directed at him do you think do you think people have lost interest in this story i think so i think uh i think when i first made my documentary i guess that um yeah i think it was very much really reactionary there seemed to be three camps there was you know uh we think he did it we don't think he did it. And then the what I thought was the centre position, which is I don't know. And mm. I think that's kind of the position that I think people forget that I don't know is actually like an answer. Sometimes you have yes, no, and I don't know. Uh, and sometimes it's better than yes or no. I agree. I mean, just uh, people, it's, it's kind of uh, feels almost like a concession, doesn't it? You know, some people get forced into this corner of pretending to know things that they don't actually know because they just can't bear the thought of saying i don't know uh i yeah. i was sort of I, I was in the don't i don't know camp i i thought the um i mean i've, I've watched your your analysis of it and i kind of agree with you know it was sensationalized wasn't it it was obviously mm -hmm. meant as entertainment in some some regards i thought it was some some of the uh, shots in it were a little bit cheap kind of using his comedy as a smoking gun it's like they don't mm -hmm. really know what a joke is but i i was in the the middle camp here but i was also in the camp that was very annoyed at people that were just completely dismissing all the allegations out of hand yes. and attributing this sort of thing to some sort of media conspiracy to take down Russell Brand because Russell Brand rather because he's this massive threat to the establishment. He's going to bring down the the world economic uh, world economic forum rather, uh, etc. I mean, how much stock do you put in the idea that Russell Brand's a sort of threat to the establishment? Well, see, I I think, I mean, I I stopped my my analysis of it at the channel four documentary because Got you. The, there's only so much i i can definitely find out about you know how how much of an attack he is on the establishment but um yeah my mine was just pretty much i don't think i've seen a documentary that's so um manipulative and like prop propagandizing i don't know if that's a word it but, is um, now we're gonna yes. get, get yeah. on the phone uh, yeah, okay so, sorry go sorry, ahead go on. No, after I, was you. Just, I was just going to say, I think there was just so many things in there that I remember when I first watched it, I was watching it with my girlfriend and we were like, it were, I was kind of like uh, commenting along with it, but because uh, I'm kind of like, I've been doing filmmaking for about 15 years. I was coming at it from like a kind of filmmaking perspective and there was just so many things that like, some things were really smart if you take away how moral they were. So like, for instance, like the, the stock footage that like, uh, I mean, I don't know if many people know it was stock footage, but for instance, when you see, I think it's in the story with Alice, one of the, one of the accusers, um, you see clips of Russell Brand's bedroom um, and it's like these black shoots and a th uh, sheets, sorry. And I think there's, there's like an animal skull with horns on a chair and you're like, oh my God, is that really what Russell Brand's bedroom looks like? But it turns out it's just from Pond 5 or Alimony. And it's it's like, well, what did you search? I just said evil bedroom. So Is that right? Okay. Yeah, yeah so, so it's, it's just stock footage. And the same with Alice. I think, well, I know I was just talking about her, but pretty much the what they did with her is they put like a VHS filter over the top of some of her footage, which makes you think, 
oh, is that like home video of Alice uh, when she was younger? Because, you know, she's the youngest accuser. She's 16. And no, it, it's just stock footage with a VHS filter to make you think, oh, my God, look how long ago it was. Look how big of an age gap there was. Right, and, okay. Yeah, I just thought it was really compelling. That, that's interesting. I mean, let's let's talk a little bit about the, uh, I mean, you highlight the text message exchanges between Russell Brand and a, a number of his accusers in your analysis. They featured quite heavily in the Dispatches documentary and some of the newspaper reporting as well. Uh, they, they were, not only could it be said that maybe they were misrepresented in the headlines or you had to really dig to get the context and, and create a false impression, but you also kind of point out potential digital manipulation shenanigans in your your uh, analysis of it as well don't you yeah I mean, I mean i can't take full credit for that i think it was actually that umbrella guy that told sean about uh the these text message manipulations and i found that if you if you look online for the text messages that are in the times article you can find like a jpeg and it's about 500 kilobytes. So it's, it's really low resolution. You zoom in on that and you can find artifacts on that. But if you're zooming in on something that low resolution, you're going to find artifacts. So it's, yeah. it's actually harder to tell whether it's manipulated. But what I did was I got really invested in this whole project and I actually signed up to uh, the Times, which is behind a paywall. Uh, so I actually paid to, just for that article. And so I went to the Times website and found the, the picture and it's a it's a high quality png so it's about 10 times the quality of the jpeg that's available online and you zoom in and you can really see the artifacts the bits where the texts are bold and um, the message isn't quite straight i mean there's layers to the um the phone overlay as if it's been overlaid twice so you can really tell and they they never say that they're representing it you know as as verbatim from a phone screen but why else would you not? Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, this suggests to me that there is messages that, that there are messages rather that have been taken via screenshot and maybe perhaps they've been, been amalgamated or there's been something removed. I mean, just to play devil's advocate on this score, could it possibly be that potentially identifying information has been removed with this person being quite young, obviously uh, wishing to maintain anonymity. Could it possibly be that rather, you know, uh, personally revealing uh, identity related information in there has been excised from these text messages? I, I would to I would totally agree. And that could totally be the case. Uh, the thing is, I don't think it, I think representing it as one block of text as they do in the Times article, uh, as if it's came straight from the phone. Um, and I think even in the documentary as well, they show they show the full text message, which you can find in the Times article, but they highlight just a quarter of a section. Uh, so the full text message is up for about half a second, and they highlight what they want you to read. And, and like I said, yes, maybe there could be some personal information in there, but in other documents that they show, they do redact it. Um, and I just think it's really dishonest to just kind of show them together as like um, a big block of text as if as if that's what was said verbatim. Yeah. And I, I think that obviously the thing you're referencing as well is this idea that the the sentence in the text message to Russell Brand, the, the phrase no means no. Uh, was highlighted. Now, this is a very common rephrase used in sort of anti-rape campaigns, raising awareness about consent uh, and sexual abuse and, and things like that. No means no is a very popular refrain in their movements. And that isolated on its own without the fuller context gives the impression it pertains solely to a rape, perhaps. That, that's the impression that would be created in most people's heads. Some of the newspapers ran with that on their front pages as well. And you, and the, the fuller context was there, but you had to you had to seek it. So a, a false impression had already been created in many people's heads, apparently, or when you read it in its full context. This relates to um, Russell Brand asking whether or not um, he can have sex with or without a condom. And yeah. the, the the accuser says with, she wanted protected sex. Russell didn't, uh, uh, sorry, didn't agree to those wishes and went ahead and had sex unprotected, which in its own right is bad enough and may very well constitute uh, an act, a, a criminal act of sexual assault. I'm not quite sure where the law is on mm. that, but so I mean, there there is a there is obviously clear idea of who he is and a bit of wrongdoing. But can, I mean, is it fair? I mean, it's, it is fair to say, isn't it that that kind of thing is a completely different thing from outright rape, which is a, a, a false impression that was created by those isolated sentences. 
Absolutely. And I, I, I also really, really, really want to make clear that I actually really don't like Russell Brand. Like, like as like a person, I don't find him funny. I don't like his flowery language um, and stuff like that. I can't say that. Um, and and yet, so so it's like there's there's one person I dislike more than him, and that's James Corden for completely different <laughs> reasons. I um, feel like my spirit animal this evening, Josh. I'm, I'm right yeah. with you, right with you on this. And and so and so the whole point was was that. Uh, when this dispatches documentary came out, I was like, right, cool, ready to jump on board the train, you know, if there is one. Yeah. And, yeah. and then it couldn't convince me. And I felt I am your target audience. And just being, you know, having a bias towards him to more readily accept bad things coming from him, you still couldn't convince me. And I thought that was, that really showed how poor the evidence was. Um, in the documentary and and i know people have said well they could have more and it could be waiting for a court case cool well let's wait for the court case yeah i think that i think that's fair and there was there were obviously i mean there's two two competing principles for me on this i suppose and obviously the i'm not necessarily competing maybe they're not mutually exclusive or they are but i'll get your opinion on it but this idea that it's innocent proven guilty of course is a is a legal um principle and it should apply to everyone on the planet as, as far as I'm concerned. And these are criminal accusations against Russell Brand. So the ideal place for these criminal investigations is the courtroom, obviously. But unfortunately, depressingly, as we know, uh, historic sexual assault accusations are sometimes very difficult to prove. Sometimes, you know, the, the, the people always bang on feminists in particular about the, the low conviction rate for rapes and, and things like that could it and obviously we've got the freedom of the press that plays into that they're perfectly within a legal right to publish allegations within limits of, of this sort so how do we balance this thing between exposing the only way we can what could potentially be a, a notorious threat to the safety of women and upholding this principle of innocent until proven guilty because i think some people are placing it as an and or an or when really yeah. culture and the law would allow for both yeah it's it's a difficult one because there's i mean there's no real uh, there, there's too many bad sides for both parties so it, it's like you know from one extreme you have the believe all women and from the other extreme um well, I guess you have believe all men, but I mean, I mean then, <laughs> then you have a, I, I mean, if you look at cases like the uh, the Johnny Depp trial, for instance, yeah. and stuff like that, it was like before he was uh, acquitted and stuff. It you know it had a big mark on his career, and even so, uh, today uh, will have some kind of effect on it as well. Yeah. So, so it's it's kind of hard to see where where to go. I I understand what what you're saying is in the. I mean, at the end of the day, there does need to be evidence for for certain things. And I don't know how to solve that because it's very, well, I'm just me. And and also, I, I don't quite know. I, I mean, I, I want to say it needs to be brought to the court sooner, but that just seems, I mean, in just my head, really insensitive to say because yeah. I'm, I'm not going through their situation. It is terrible, isn't it? Because it has come to a point where saying these allegations belong in a courtroom is almost akin in most people's minds to, to you saying, I don't believe these women, yeah. which is not necessarily, you know, isn't the case. I mean, obviously the, these allegations to me are so important. They deserve the highest level of justice, which would be a courtroom. But should we, should we um, read anything into the, the facts as far as I'm aware up to this day that Russell Brand doesn't appear to have launched any sort of defamation case against the producers of dispatches. Is that significant in any way? You know what I, I've, I see. I'm I'm not too familiar with the law, but I think that because I I've I've always thought around the accusers. It's like it's very difficult for Russell Brand to respond when the four people that are accusing him, hmm. it may not be the right people he's thinking of in his head, or if if you know they're not real, uh, which I'm not saying they're not, then how does he respond to that there's no names or anything it's like how do you deny is it's like in in a court when it's uh innocent until proven guilty or you get found guilty or not guilty you don't get found innocent yeah you, you just get found not guilty so if you've not 
done anything how do you really prove your innocence yeah i mean so, it's a difficult one but i mean in terms of the way the defamation and libel laws work in the uk i mean it would be the person who's publishing the allegations would be responsible in this case so it would be the production company of dispatches it wouldn't necessarily be the accused on the show who are, who are anonymous anyway it's, okay. it's, the, it's that show that has potentially well definitely has ruined his reputation so he's got he's certainly passed the bar there for reputational damage based on these accusations it would be about the production company then proving these were fair and evidenced uh which mm. uh, i can imagine would be quite difficult i believe it's quite high bar in this country to do that but just to get my tinfoil hat on from a different perspective now we have we have one people on one camp who are, who are floating the conspiracy theory that he's this massive threat to the establishment and there must be brought down at all costs which i i, I do, i'm not nearly as impressed with russell brand to believe he's a threat to anything established yeah. or otherwise uh, there's the other conspiracy theory on the flip side that says well if you look at his traje trajectory he already dropped out of hollywood he stopped being mainstream he made himself self-contained on his youtube channel he was you know raking in money with that he was putting on his own events under his name around this sort of political activism a lot of people are looking at that as a smoking gun and saying he saw this coming over the hill he saw the fact that he'd never work in hollywood again if these things came to light and he found a way to make himself uh self-sustained does that kind of uh make sense to you on any level it, it makes sense to me uh i just i i i mean he changed his whole personality he's no longer this kind of uh or apparently is no longer this kind of womanizer anymore. And it could all be a sham. Um, and I wouldn't put it past him, but um, it could also not be. So I, I think, like I said, I, I don't like commenting on things that I, I don't have a good basis on. It's definitely a possibility, but um, I guess the only person that would really know that is is Russell Brand or those close to him. Yeah. I mean, what do, what do you make of the fact that really... You know, it's, it's strange. I mean, we've had this with this mini, uh, this sort of documentary with, uh, no, sorry, not documentary, is it? It's, it's kind of um, a docu-series, not even that. It's a docu-drama with Steve Coogan. That's what I was reaching for, The Reckoning yes. on, on Jimmy yeah. Savile. And we have this being broadcast on the BBC, which is, is largely about uh, a serial offender who committed his crimes whilst un enjoying the cover of the BBC while he was doing mm. it. It also seems very strange. And on the other side of this, we also have Channel 4, putting a, an expose out on Russell Brand, accusing him of some of the most heinous crimes, uh, imaginable painting a very dark picture of the man. And all the while, they were basically aiding him uh, and procuring these women for him, allegedly, and paying him the big bucks to prepare, prepare, appear on TV shows. What, what can we make of TV uh, channels doing this and kind of exposing their own uh, complicity in these things? Yeah, I, I was actually... It's funny you said that. I was thinking of that earlier today. And I, it makes me think, why did they, for two companies to do that kind of go, maybe we'll expose ourselves to some degree. I mean, there's, there's definitely different answers it could be, you know, is, is Channel 4 and the BBC trying to get ahead of the, of the real, you know, depth of the depravity behind it by exposing it first so that then they, they have some control over the narrative uh which which is you know definitely a possibility um yeah it's kind of it's a it's a very sketchy one i think i think i i did think with the the comparison to jimmy savile um in the dispatches documentary was in, incredibly like wrong it was yeah. like because i i remember i had an argument with my friend who was saying well jimmy savile was never formally accused and i was like well yeah he was, he was dead <laughs> but, also, but but also it was like if you compare the evidence with you know Russell Brand had against him to what Jimmy Savile had against him. So Russell Brand, uh, from what we've seen, some text messages, a, a crisis center document, and four anonymous accusers. Jimmy Savile had you know uh, just under I think five hundred allegations against him. A lot of them that were proven or backed up at least with uh logs into hospitals you know visit logs yeah. and stuff so it's like and and names given forward to to actual victims so so it's like the difference is is night and day essentially but i, I don't think that answered your question 
Oh, well, I, I'm not sure there is an answer to my question, to be honest, mm. but I think you've you kind of you've you, you've got there in a roundabout way. But I suppose as well, this Jimmy Savile thing's really interesting to me. This idea, because I see this all the time now, and they definitely did this in the documentary. Essentially, it was a case of look at the man we're accusing of bad things, laughing and joking with a man who definitely did bad things. You know, draw your own conclusions. Yes. That's how it felt. And I mean, Jimmy Savile was ubiquitous. He is. He was incredibly publicly promiscuous as well. I don't think there's a swimming bath in the northwest that he didn't open, yeah. for, for instance, or something like that. Every, every somebody's I know has def, like met Jimmy Savile for sure, and I see this now. Whenever there's a celebrity who has a, an opinion on Twitter, somebody will bring up a picture of him sort of next to Jimmy Savile uh, as mm. well. I mean, what what do we make of this this tactic? And have you ever met Jimmy Savile? I suppose is my next question. <laughs> I I have never met Jimmy Savile, thankfully. I I mean I I don't know whether I can say this but i i always thought just from the the look of him <laughs> it's, it's someone you wouldn't really want to be near and he suits the profile of someone who'd done the crimes that he did it looks so, like a scooby-doo villain doesn't he i think it's kind of yeah it's, it's it's all there on you know maybe that was the greatest defense wasn't it you know maybe he can't possibly be a bad man look you know it's too obvious yeah i think so and also it was not i the amount of interviews i've seen with people that say what what was he known for? He was like a man with like very little talent. Like it was like the the screen presence wasn't really there. I but but there was something with the the older generation of people that that really liked him. Um, and and I always think of my my granddad who who always used to go now then now then. And it was just like it was it was a catchphrase that people like. But you watch him and you think he's not to me. To me, I don't think he's particularly like. I wouldn't choose to watch him. I would probably switch him over if he was on, you know, taking the place of Eamon Holmes, and he yeah. hadn't been convicted of all the things. I'm, I'm not sure. Like... I'm not sure how old you are, but I used to live for Jim will fix it when I was a kid. I think they they fixed it for some young lad to drive a Batmobile once, and I think that was the coolest thing that I've ever seen cool. in my life. Yeah, but I mean, I, I can only suspect as well. Maybe there's some sort of BBC Northern quota. They have to, uh, they have to yeah. uh, fulfill. Perhaps it's, perhaps it's that. I mean, just one last thing on on Savile, and and maybe it ties into Russell Brand quite a bit as well, because they were showing a lot of historic historical clips of him being very flirtatious, a lot of sexualized language, comments which are out, you know, in this post Me Too movement now, a lot of people are very sensitive about the things that I said. A lot of things that were said just five minutes ago can't be said anymore for, mm -hmm. for good or, you know, for, for worse, whatever your opinion is for sure. But placing a lot of that older stuff, some of it 10, 15 years old, and putting it under the light of today's standards, was that a bit of an unfair tactic as well for what something, you know, may have just been thought of as flirtatious, boyish banter, now seems somewhat more deviant given the culture shift? I, I think it's definitely a change in the, in the culture from from the time and obviously i think i think in some ways we're right to look back at like uh you know jimmy savile and russell brand and go that's you know that maybe shouldn't have been allowed on tv you know to some extent i think some people take it too far and i i also think that was kind of the reason behind me wanting to make the russell brand kind of a uh, documentary that that i did is that Basically, it wasn't for views or anything or, you know, to get people to to watch it. It was really the fact that you, for me, taking the middle stance of I don't know, like I said at the beginning, it seemed from what I was looking at online that I was fitting in the camp of you are an R word sympathizer. Hmm. And I think to, if if I'm coming from the middle, I think that's a really bad thing for society to you know, basically force you into, if you are a good person, then you believe that, uh, you know, he is this. And I, th I thought that was really unfair. And I actually, I kind of made the, the film to, in my own way, be brave. And I, I know that sounds really strange and like, probably like, well, it's not that brave, but it's, it's like, when I was doing it, I was like, I thought I could potentially lose some work here and stuff yeah. you know if, if this gets into the wrong hands and someone is ultra sensitive to this and doesn't take uh my my i don't know as uh, as an i don't know then i could be in trouble yeah I, I mean that is the thing isn't it that is that climate of if you're just sincerely trying to analyze things in an objective 
way and don't immediately come down emphatically on the one camp or another, you're suddenly smeared as an apologist for something or not. Yeah. So I, I do think it is a, is brave in an instant, in a, in a way. It's also not a bit of an issue as well, the fact that, I mean, you've mentioned Johnny Depp and Amber Heard there, and I'm, I'm guilty of this. I'm not saying this as someone who's above it, but it became a, almost a form of entertainment for mm. me and my partner to sit down and watch that trial. I think we actually got snacks in especially yeah. for it one night. And it, is it is it this weird culture we're living in now where, where you know, po- cases involving celebrities that, in, you know, include some very dark and, and, and horrible allegations of some serious criminal uh, behaviour has become somewhat entertainment uh, to the rest of us? Yeah, and, and I'm I'm no different to you. I, I think, you know, the Johnny Heard and Amber Depp thing was really entertaining. So I think just from a really primal nature, just just going, oh, who's lying? Who's, you know, you've got yeah. like, you're being your own detective at home. We all became body like, language experts, didn't we, I think? Exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's like, yeah, it, it was thoroughly entertaining. But I think in terms of entertainment, now is such a strange time because I think there's so many different forms. Like, um, you know, TikTok is all, all the rage and stuff now. And like some people, I, I mean, this is just me being frivolous, but some people, you know, do all the dances on TikTok. And I just think, who watches that? Not <laughs> not necessarily that, like, I think it's bad, but I just can't imagine someone going, I love this. Yeah. You know, someone just just miming. Yeah. I think I, I think I tweeted out a while back that we need a moratorium on people recreating the Wednesday Adam dance on TikTok. Oh, that's, yeah. that's all I saw for about three months straight. Well, Josh, it's been, it's been a pleasure speaking to you. It's fascinating. Uh, maybe you can just let people know uh, where they can find uh, your work if they want to want to seek it out and watch your stuff. Oh, yeah. Cheers. Uh, I'm on Josh Woods Films on YouTube. Uh, should show, show up there. But uh, predominantly, I am just a, a, a filmmaker. Excellent. Well, I could have spoke to you for a good hour or so about that alone, I, I would imagine. But thank you very much for speaking to us. I appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate it more. Take care. Bye. Bye. Another great guest. Uh, 